I was disgusted by the woman I saw in the mirror. I was disgusted with the woman she became, but I was done. I was done being disgusted. I was done not knowing who I was anymore. How the hell do you go from being brought up super confident to then finding someone who diminished you so much that you found yourself staring in the mirror, being that disgusted? In a relationship when one person loves another more, and I think that was my case. I loved him way more than he loved me. And because of that, I really, I built a relationship in my head and I wanted it to be it, but it was not. Mm -hmm. And everybody outside of me, they saw me, all of my friends, my parents, everybody's like, Marina, what are you doing? And I was like, no, you guys don't understand. This is my amazing life. This is my amazing husband and everything is great. Uh, and I did not recognize the verbal abuse because um, it's kind of like hard to identify, but it's it kind of like you get there slowly because it starts with like, hey, you're not a good businesswoman. And the reason why our business is not working is because you're mismanaging or whatever it might be. And by the way, you're a bad mother. You know, you're not raising our kids properly. You're a bad mother. You're a horrible wife. And everything you do is not the right thing. And everything is your fault. And slowly you start believing into this. You know, when you told hundred times the same thing over and over again, you, it's kind of like becomes your reality, good or bad, right? That's some, we talk mm -hmm. about affirmations, why affirmations work, because if you repeat it, you start believing it. But if you repeat the bad stuff, you start believing it too. And kind of like probably what's about seven years into that relationship, I was a completely different person. I, I lost the woman I always, or considered, I thought that I was. I lost the confidence, I lost the strength, I lost, I just lost myself. Mm -hmm. I did not know anymore who I am and what I wanna do and I felt so hopeless and disgusted because in my head I still had that story that I'm strong, right? And then I'm looking in the mirror and I was like, you're not strong, who do you think you are? You just lost, you're disgusted by yourself, you have no confidence and your future looks pretty bleak. So that's why I found myself in my mid-30s. God, thank you so much for breaking that down. Um, this is the thing. This is the moments where I think, how do we women not actually end up living the life that we really want? And I think so much of it is we encounter these um, romantic relationships and sometimes they can bring us so much to our knees that we lose our confidence and now we don't know how to get back up. So how did you, in those moments where you've done the justification, you're, you know, kind of like trying to ease the, the emotional pain that I'm sure you were going through. When you look at yourself in that mirror, how did you then say, I'm done? You know, it was, um, it was a moment I very clearly remember that. Um, it was um, New Year's Eve. I was sitting with my boy. Um, he was uh, three, almost three years old at the time. So I was holding him in my lap and I look at the Christmas tree and I thought of, to myself, like, I don't know why, but this moment is going to be very special. And I feel like this is a pivotal moment in my life when my life is going to change. Um, and for a second, I didn't realize what's happening. But then, you know, I, I started seeing glimpse of, you know, woman that I was at some point, you know, me being strong, me being a businesswoman, me you know, running my business, being successful, being a great mom, because I was running a successful business before. So I know I, I can do this, right? But I bought into that story. So I saw some proof of that I can be a good wife, that I can be a good mom, and I can be a good businesswoman. And then I lost it through time. And then all of a sudden I saw like a vision of, you know, just a glimpse of me being in the future, strong and powerful and living the life of my dreams with the men of my dreams. And, you know, that idea that she is possible, that she's somewhere out there. I just need to find her. I just need to rebuild her. It was so strong. And I was like, you know what? Like that was like at the beginning, it started with hope. I was like, okay, there is hope. There is that woman somewhere. I just need to find her. And then more I thought about it, that hope became more, uh, it just became so strong and so like it's like inevitable truth all of a sudden that is like she's there she's out there i'm now i'm determined so i moved from hopeful to determined to 
rebuild this woman again because I know it's possible. Mm -hmm. So in my case, uh, my parents separated when I was three years old. I separated with the father of my daughter when she was three years old. And that New Year's Eve night was when my son was three years old. Mm -hmm. And I was going through the thought as like, I cannot live like this anymore. I, I do not want to wake up with this man anymore. It's just destroying me as a human, as a woman. I do not want to live like this anymore. But at the same time, that thought is like, okay, three years old me, three years old my daughter, three years old my boy. And now you immediately start thinking, it's like, oh, what's going to happen when my kids have their own kids? Will they going to continue this vicious cycle? And as a mother, I'm like, I'm not going to let it happen. If it's, up to, if it's to be, it's up to me, right? I'm going to break it and I'm going to stick to this marriage and I'm going to make it work regardless of anything, right? And in my head at that time, it was a justification that I'm doing the right thing, mm. right? That I'm doing it for my kids, for their better future, for, you know, for them not having the issues that I had to go through. And because I knew that when I separated with my daughter's father, it was tough, it was hard on her, and I did not want to put my son through that again. And uh, at work, uh, I met Eric, and uh, we kind of like, we became good friends, and I shared with him. And he said, and I said, I, can't, I cannot break this relationship because of my kids. And then he asked me, what do you think gonna serve your kids better? Seeing you crying to sleep, every single night and being miserable and being disrespected and not being happy, not living up to your full potential or you chasing your dreams or you finding your passion or you being happy and you being loved for who you are, the way you are. What do you think gonna set a better example for them? And for me, that was the moment when, you know, when the life kind of like mm -hmm. ran through my eyes in the split of a second and I immediately thought of one thing. Okay, so if I do not leave this broken marriage and I stay justifying it because it's for my kids, and then one day somebody gonna either bully my kids or somebody gonna tell them boo, somebody gonna tell them no, they would come to me and say, they would ask for reassurance. They will look for some hope, right? For some guidance. And I'll tell, no, you got this, baby. You can do this. You can be who you are. You can achieve everything you want in life. You're awesome. You got this. You can be happy. You can have it all. And then they would ask me, what well, if I can have it, why you didn't mm -hmm. have it? Why you didn't do it? And that's when it was an aha moment for me when I realized that I was using my kids as an excuse. And that was immediately the moment when I realized I cannot do this anymore. For my kids, I need to find this woman. For my kids, I need to become stronger. For my kids, I need to find that one and only man who will love me and care for me and love me unconditionally with all of my imperfections, with all of my weaknesses, with all of my weirdnesses, just me for who I am. Because that's what true love is, right? That's how we can build this relationship and make it solid. But I need to show them that it's possible because I'm also setting up an example of what the marriage should look like for them mm -hmm. when they grow up, right? I will be an example. They would look, they would think it's normal. And because of that, they will accept challenges and narcissist behavior or abusive behavior and think it's okay. So that just one thought that my daughter gonna marry somebody just like my ex at that time, I was like, that was horrifying. At the same time, I, I built a successful business and through time I lost it because my husband at the time told me, I was like, oh, you just stay home, you just raise kids and I'll take care of the business. And so being a homestead mom was not necessarily my thing. So what I came out of that fog in my head for a couple of years and I was like, got back to business, there was no business anymore. He just made multiple not proper decisions and I'm not blaming him for anything because I gave up that control. I allowed that to happen. So it's fully my responsibility for, you know, don't complain about what you allow. And I cannot complain because I allowed that. So can I just stop you for a second? Yes. That's, that's so <clears throat> strong. That's really freaking powerful for some people. Really powerful. It's also detrimental for someone to hear if they're still wounded because now they're feeling like a victim in that moment. How did you find the power in it instead of feeling like the victim in it? 
Because um, on one side, I'm a control freak, right? <laughs> that's, not, that's not a good thing. So once I realized that I lost that control, right? Once I realized that I lost control of my business, I lost control of my finances, because I was told, told since I was a little girl by my mom that a woman has to be financially independent, period, end of story. Not because you're going to be like whatever. It just... You have the ability to have your own choices that, for example, you don't have to stay in a broken marriage because you don't have the money to leave. And that's where I found myself because for a couple of years that I kind of like took the eye from the business and was not managing it, everything fell apart. And now I did not have the money to leave even that marriage anymore to the point that I could not feed my kids tomorrow. It was that bad. Mm -hmm. I lost all of my assets. I lost my business. I did not have any source of income. So I was like, okay, great. Now I'm kind of like powered up myself. Okay, I'm gonna leave, but now where am I gonna leave? There is no place for me to leave. I cannot feed my kids tomorrow. I cannot rent the place. I cannot provide a roof over their head. So for, for a woman, this is the most horrifying feeling. And, and so in that, that sense of security, and so in that moment, taking ownership, that empowered you instead of crushed you. It, it just like, you know, it put my back against the wall. And mm. I think a lot of times when you know that the bridges are burnt, there is no place to go back. I realized I cannot live in that marriage anymore. I need to get out of here. At the same time, I had to only move forward because there was no door back, mm. right? So that need forced me doing it scared, doing it alone, doing it without knowing what's going to happen because I had no clue what's going to happen, right? I did not know what the future going to look like for me, what I'm going to do for business. Uh, but at the same time, I got desperate on one side, but determined on the other side. You know, so I was, was just it the like, desperation that led to the determination then? I think so. And, you know, it's like one of the things that I constantly ask myself, because just like you, I spent a lot of time with very smart people. And I was like, can somebody explain to me what happens when, you know, two people from the same environment, from the same background, from the same family, when they faced with adversity, um, one person takes it and takes ownership and crushes it and not blaming for the past experiences, not blaming their parents, not blaming their environment, not blaming the government or the employer or the teacher or whoever, and moves forward. And another person, it might be twin brothers, twin sisters, that close. I've seen it in real life. And a second person who was raised in exactly the same circumstances, with exactly the same environment and everything, decides to know life is not fair. I cannot live like this. It's not my responsibility. They start blaming everything. They start, you know, finding excuses for themselves and take away that control. And instead, they become a victim and the other person becomes a victor. So to me, it's like, I'm always trying to find the answer. What is this? It's like, is it something we're born with? Is it something we develop through life? Or what is it? I don't know. I'm like, what, is, what do you think? Well, this is why I wanted you on. This is exactly. I'm sorry, my dear, <laughs> this was exactly why I wanted to bring you on because I had met you in your success, right? You, for, if people don't know who you are, they need to go look you up. In your success, I'd met you, and then I heard all of your backstory, and um, and as I started to ask you questions, you know, as we've been hanging out, the fact that you're from the Ukraine, I start to ask you about your family, about how you grew up, and it was like utter poverty and then thinking through what you've been through having to leave the country finding this guy who is emotionally abusive and yet you're able like my, one of my favorite uh, quotes is from um Shawshank Redemption where he's like I had to crawl through you know like 10 miles of shit to get clean on the other side um it's kind of like that you've been through so much and at moments that other people would fall and not get back up of other moments where people don't have the strength don't have the emotional strength to get back up you just kept going woman and you kept going to the point where you can sit here and say i took ownership <laughs> over it i started to see that it was my choice my decision and to your point is it freaking genetics or is it a mindset and i really I've dedicated my life to believing it's a mindset, which is why I do this show, in the hopes that I can get people like yourself on that can give these small little nuggets of it doesn't matter where you've been. And again, I am not dismissing anyone's history, mm -hmm. but right now, 
how do we pivot? How? How do we start to own our freaking lives? Because looking back and being the victim, I don't know how it can serve you. Now, Mel Robbins, um, one of my good friends, says, um, it is not your responsibility what's happened to you. It is not your responsibility what has happened to you. But it is your responsibility of how you react to it. So let's take <laughs> it back to you've left the relationship. You realize you, you've lost yourself. You said, how do I find myself again? I really do believe it's you built yourself again. Right. So what did that building blocks look like? Let's go through those. So I think back to the conversation that we just had is a genetics or mindset. Uh, I do not think it's genetics because, like I said, I've seen twins mm -hmm. doing totally polar opposite things. Mindset also, I think there is something that we do not know yet because I don't know the answer because like mindset is something that you develop through life, mm -hmm. right? But if people are surrounded with exactly the same circumstances, technically they should be developing similar mindset, right? Mm -hmm. So I do believe it's still something inside of us, but it's not something, it's like, it's as basic as hunger but it's as powerful as hunger because, you know, hunger of being more, of doing more, um, or certain belief systems that you, because like, just like you said, Mel says that it's not what happens to you. And Tony, Tony Robbins says that the same thing. Uh, it's not what happens to you. It's how you react to it that matters. It's two different people in the same circumstances. They just react differently because of some something that is inside of them. So for me, I think that one of the things that I always, since I was a little girl, I I thought I'm special, whatever. Yeah, don't judge me. But uh, no, I love that. <laughs> I'm excited. But, you we need to own that. We're all <clears throat> freaking special in our own way. We all are amazing <laughs> and special. But what I was thinking is that I always considered myself as the main character of the movie, right? So my entire life is the movie set and the movie is happening in front of other people's eyes and it's playing in the theater. And we know that when the movie starts, we are met with the character and then stuff starts happening to the character, right? They go left, they go right, they win, they lose. And like as a spectator, sometimes the audience, which is like, don't go there, you're gonna fall. Don't, don't do this, it's scary, it's dangerous. But as a character, we may not necessarily know that, right? So we need to experience that. So I, I always thought of my life being a movie and as a character, who is on a journey to become a hero has to go through the ups and downs, mm -hmm. has to go through the roller coaster of life. But at the end, I will win because I am a hero in the making. So every time I would fall, I would think it's like, okay, it's just a stumble. I just stumbled on the bottom of that roller coaster of life. I need to get up because I am a hero. And what you feed your mind with is so important. It's just so pivotal, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So if you are listening to something meaningless or people complaining or uh, the horror stories on TV or whatever, it, it, it's just not productive information. It's not the information that's going to feed you positive thoughts or positive ideas or um, explore opportunities, none of those things. So you need to be very uh, mindful and again I'm just saying from my experience you guys need to do you do whatever you feel is best like what I did for me and what helped me is to control what I'm absorbing as an information because you know through my marriage right like you bad mother you bad businesswoman you bad this you bad that that information was a bad information that I allowed into my brain mm -hmm. so I need to stop that information and replace it with something good. So I started listening to Tony Robbins. I started listening to Bob Proctor. Um, I, few years prior, I discovered our good friend, Lisa Nichols, who uh, watched The Secret and I just started following her around and see what's happening. And all the amazing thought leaders, that's what I started feeding my brain with. And that helped me to kind of like rebuild that belief step by step and then i started taking some actions and then i was like oh i guess i'm not that bad oh i guess i can do this oh i guess i'm a good mother oh i guess and all those little steps started building that empire of confidence and belief in me that empire of confidence that's amazing and <laughs> um, thank you for taking me through those steps because 
there's the difference, and I say this all the time, there's such a massive difference between believing and actually doing, right? And so you can believe all you want. You right. can listen to the empowering, you know, motivational, inspirational speeches and stuff like that. But when you find yourself in those moments where you don't necessarily believe in yourself, where you have that person repeating to you that you're no good, um, having those tactics to actually get out is so imperative. And I love what you say about the five people. It's so true. Just another, um, you know, reason 1,262 of why I love being around you mm -hmm. is because I get influenced by you. So m for me, surrounding myself by inspiring women empowers me. Um, and then I actually heard you say, I've never heard this, I love this, where you were like, I actually seek to be um, the, at the bottom of my num my group of five. Yep. Explain that to me. And this is just one more example of how people can see that you can go from feeling terrible about yourself, not having any esteem, looking in the mirror and being disgusted with yourself to this. What? what up my homies, it's Lisa Billiou and I'm so excited to share with you my new mini series exclusively on Spotify, releasing all month long during the month of May. I'll be talking with entrepreneurs, doctors, artists, therapists, thought leaders and anyone else who knows what it takes to find balance in your life, the importance of putting yourself first and how to take back your freaking control and your power of your mental and physical health. I've partnered with BetterHelp for this series to help bring you these inspiring and empowering episodes. BetterHelp knows how important it is to feel supported, not just through Mental Health Awareness Month, but all year round. Because let's face it, that's what it takes to be a freaking badass and achieve your dreams. And the best part, it's completely free and it's available exclusively on Spotify. Search for Women of Impact on Spotify and visit betterhelp.com slash impact theory to get 10% off your first month. I think that, uh, first of all, there is uh, what it's called uh, law of average. And uh, I heard it for the first time from my husband, Eric. Uh, basically, you are the average of five people you're spending most of your time with, right? Uh, because if you really think about it, like who are your friends, who is your surrounding, who is your circle of influence, you, at the end of the day, you eat what they eat, you read what they read, you watch what they watch, you listen what they listen. And if you compare your income level, you are probably somewhere in the middle of that five, right? Because you are on the same wave, you're thinking same things, you're dreaming similar things, you're doing similar things, right? So you're on that bubble of average. And uh, a lot of people think it's like, oh, it's so awesome to be the top of the five because now I'm the coolest. And here's the thing, the top of the five gonna feed your ego, right? It's like, yeah, look at me, I'm the most influential, I'm the most powerful, look at me, it's cool to be me. But at the end of the day, it's not, to me, it's the most horrible position to be in. I am always seeking to be the dumbest person in the room because guess what? What the average, what's the law of average is, right? If you are the top, the bottom of that five will pull you down. But if you wanna increase your average, if you wanna become a little bit better, if you wanna become a little bit more powerful, a little bit more influential, a little bit more impactful, then you would wanna be at the bottom so that average can pull you up. So that's why I'm always trying to, you know, like I said, find a seat at the table because there are a lot of very powerful tables that we might wanna sit in but uh, there are, as far as I know, there are only two ways to get the seat at the better table. You either need to earn your way into it by through your experiences, through your mistakes and your failures and overcoming all the different challenges, you earn your position as equal at that table, right? Or you can buy your seat at the table by buying somebody's courses, buying somebody's books, attending their events, buying their wisdom, hiring coaches and things like that. That's why for me, I was at that time when I was growing my confidence, I was buying that confidence. I was buying a different mindset. I was buying my seat at a better table in everywhere I could to learn from these amazing, powerful people, right? So eventually I can earn my way into the better table. Dude, I love this so much. When I heard you say it, I was like, I'm so going to do that from now on. I don't think about it. But the, the instinctualness of 
the ego thing, people being around people to make themselves feel better. I get it. When you've got low self-esteem, you're sometimes grasping at straws, right? And you're just like, I just need something to make myself, myself feel better right now. And so, you know, kind of going to the group of friends that are going to make you feel good, no matter what that looks like, is the natural inclination. So the idea of being around people and deliberately making sure you're not at the top of the list is beautiful. I want people to write that down right now. But how did you start to do that and not feel badly about yourself? Because it's very real. Maybe you haven't had this. The imposter syndrome. Who do you think you are sitting at this table? Right. Even if you buy yourself right by hiring coaches and things like that. The, the internal dialogue of am I good enough? Do I deserve to be here? How did, did you have that internal dialogue? And if so, how did you get over it? Uh, I, I, I had the internal dialogue like this, like, am I good enough? Am I worthy, right, to be at this table? But at the same time, I start looking at certain things. Oh, I guess I did this and that was good. And I guess I did this and that was good. And I am deserving. You know, the, the mm-hmm. self-worthiness is probably one of the uh, hard, it's kind of like, we don't pay enough attention to it and we don't understand how damaging the low self-esteem can be and how misleading and how, um, you know, just how many, you would be stunned how many successful people have very big issues with self-worthiness, with imposter syndrome and everything else. Like uh, my husband and I, we train a lot of people who make seven figures a year or more and every single time, and nobody says like, oh, I have low self-esteem, that I have this or I have that. They're always like, oh, I don't know how to do this, or I don't have enough people to talk to, or I don't know how to grow my business. Not realizing that those are just the results of the low self-esteem because they're limiting their belief about themselves. And because of that, they're either dismissing the opportunities or they're not moving forward or they're not becoming more successful, different things like that. So constantly reminding yourself that uh, you're smart, you're good, you're powerful, you're strong, kind of like building that affirmational belief in you, just like the on the opposite side, the bad stuff can can damage everything. Just reminding yourself that, yeah, look at look at what I've already accomplished, because awareness is another big thing to recognize, like, what am I good at and what am I not good at? And surrounding yourself with people who are bad at other things that are important to you, just like my husband and I, we, the way we work is, he has so many amazing skills and talents, and I am not necessarily, um, or I'm not at all uh, frustrated or worried that I'm not as good as him in particular areas. Because he's an amazing speaker, he's an amazing trainer, I'll probably never be as good of a speaker as he is. But at the same time, I recognize that I have my own good qualities, I have my own strengths, and I have my own talents that if we combine those two together, instead of comparing or competing, we combining those together and now it makes something more powerful. That's why we call ourselves Two-Headed Monster, because together we can do so many amazing things that we can do by ourselves. Oh, that's so powerful. And the worthiness piece is exactly how I feel, girl, which is why I started this whole episode on your past relationship, right? The empire that you built, I didn't even start there because to the point of if you don't feel worthy, period, if you don't feel worthy, you're not getting up and going after that dream. And so how do we allow people or give people the the tactics and um, tips to feel worthy so they can freaking go on their dream, leave that toxic relationship, start that business, have the family they've always desired, whatever that freaking dream is, why don't we go for it? Because I think a big part of it is we don't feel worthy to have the dream in the first place. In fact, as you were laying it out, understanding why you and Eric work so well is because you both have found what your own worthiness within that relationship. Mm -hmm. And so when you find these relationships where either you're bringing the same thing to the table or someone's dismissing what you believe is worthy, now you don't feel worthy, right? So you even said he's the two-headed monster, right? He's got his skills. He's so freaking amazing. I mean, one of the biggest, most impressive speakers in the world. And you're not competing with him. Right. You're complimenting him. And now you're able to feel your own worthiness even when you're with a really powerful man and i'm actually glad that we're talking about this because i get asked this question a lot as well when you're married to someone who's very strong-willed right like my husband and your husband and we're still strong women how the hell do we stand 
our ground? And then how do we have beautiful relationships? And I think it's just that. It's finding our own worthiness, building our confidence in isolation, not with our partner, but in isolation, and then having the confidence in the relationship and finding the worthiness in the relationship so that you can both thrive. Right. And also understanding that um, we are responsible for our own emotions and our experiences through life. Right. Nobody can make you happy. Nobody can make me happy. So I think the biggest challenge comes in when we give away that power to somebody else to make us happy. So you, I remember you um, in your book and we talked about it and you told me that story as well. When um, you, you had your issues with your stomach and you were laying on the floor and you were trying to call Tom for him to come and rescue you. And then you realize that you don't need Tom to rescue you. You can rescue yourself. Right. That is such a powerful distinction. And we often forget about it. We often give the keys to the kingdom to somebody else, keys to our happiness, keys to our success, keys to our self-worthiness, keys to our confidence to somebody else thinking that they can make us happy, thinking that they can make us successful. Nobody can make you successful. Uh, we can give you all the books, all the scripts, all the knowledge, but I cannot drag you through the finish line. I can give you the knowledge and you can take it or not. Mm. And same thing with happiness. So same thing in marriage. And for us, I think recognizing, first of all, that I need to bring my best version to this marriage. And he needs to bring his best version to this marriage because I cannot make him happy. I can bring joy into his life. I can bring love. But at the same time, it's also how often you see when you give people love, you give people attention, but they're not happy. They're not satisfied mm -hmm. because your way of giving love is not necessarily their way of receiving love, mm -hmm. right? That's why the book Five Love Languages is so big because people kind of speak different languages trying to explain to each other that they love each other and they don't get it because their expectation of what love should be given in the way is different than the way they receive it. So respect is one of the big key factors in any relationship, business or personal, it doesn't matter because if there is no respect, uh, it's, um, I, I think it's eventually that relationship going to cease to exist because we all going to have differences. We all going to have different opinions. Like my husband and I could not be more polar opposite in a lot of different ways, specifically from my upbringing, right? I grew up in a communist country. He grew up in a capitalism, right? He grew up in the church family. And I grew up uh, in a communist environment when the church was and religion was prohibited completely. You know, so now we mix together and we kind of like there is a lot of stuff we need to talk about. Right. There is a lot of things that are not normal to me or mm -hmm. unusual to me. Same thing for him. Right. So we have to communicate that. But if we're not communicating that with the respect, then it turns into the fights, then it turns into drama, then people cannot hear each other, then people cannot get to the core of the problem. So if you cannot communicate to get to the core of what is bothering you, to get to the core and to build that relationship of trust, to that foundation of trust, that you feel okay to be vulnerable, that you feel okay to be yourself, and you feel okay to say, you know what, that, that bothers me, honey, that, that hurt my feelings. You know, you need to get to that safe place first, but you cannot get there. If you're not communicating respectfully, you cannot build that trust. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I want to teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I see you on the inside. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Like, how do you build trust after you've given trust over and it has been abused and it has been used against you? Um, and I think it really goes back to the thing that you were saying about building your own confidence within yourself because Eric seems like he's very confident. And so in you having your own confidence, I think it's not threatening. And so right. again, going to how do we women 
build our confidence, stay confident and find partners that can help fan it, not smother it. Because I think Mm -hmm. that that's the difference because it's already hard, right? It's already bloody hard to be confident (laughs) without anyone influencing you. So now imagine the person that you're living with, the one that you love the most is either using that fan or that fan becomes the blanket. So I've heard you, like, you take so much freaking ownership. I've heard you say, if I want a freaking castle and I want a king, I have to be worthy of being a queen. Yep. I fuck yeah, girl. So how did you, how did you become a queen? Tell me a couple of the steps. Well, first of all, is to uh, remember when, uh, I don't know about you, uh, but when I was a little girl, and I feel like a lot of little girls, we think it's like, oh, I want a prince on a white horse, mm-hmm. blue eyes, white hair, whatever, right? I want them strong, I want him powerful. But I feel like, uh, maybe because we do not know better at that time, we're chasing wrong qualities in our man. And that's probably what I was chasing in my previous marriage, in my previous relationships. Uh, I did not realize that, you know, having confident, loving and caring man is much more important than blue eyes and blonde hair mm-hmm. or the height or the weight or whatever, right? Um, I, I read an article a long time ago and it was just basically like a guy describing it like, hey, yes, I'm rich, I'm this, I'm that, whatever. And basically to women, uh, just explaining like, I do not need a doll. I do not need a pretty doll that I can put on the shelf uh, in my house and I can look at it all the time because it's gonna get boring. It's gonna be exciting for a minute and then it's gonna get stale and it's gonna be, get boring. I want a woman who is smart, intelligent, loving, caring, and all these different qualities. So it dawned on me like, okay, now I know what I do not want the relationship to look Mm. like, right? That's what I learned in my previous marriage. And I knew now what I'm looking for. And I realized like, okay, I guess that man who is confident, strong and powerful and successful and loving and caring, he's looking for that same type of woman. So in order for me to find or attract that kind of man, I need to become that woman first. So it was selfish. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was selfish rebuilding myself too. So yes, I was doing it for my kids, but, and yes, I was doing it because I couldn't live like this anymore, but I also was selfishly looking for that kind of a man and I needed to become that kind of a woman first. Mm. So I had to build that confidence. I had to realize, you know, what that relationship gonna look like. And our relationship, we started with work, you know, it was uh, because he had his own habits that he brought from his previous relationship. I had my own old habits or triggers or what we call (laughs) psychic damage that we brought both from our previous relationships. And oftentimes he would close up or I would close up and I was like, yeah, I don't wanna talk about it. Like, especially as women, we're like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. Remember that? crazy phrase so guys if a woman tells you i'm fine um it listen means that to, she's not fine at all she's not fine there is something wrong with that so eric was smart uh to kind of like push back on that and say no baby i know you much more than you give me credit mm. for talk to me talk to me because this is what happens in the relationships often enough that you know because we do not either want to go into the depth because we don't feel like it or we're not in the mood or we are worried what's going to come out of this, right? So we're not pushing our partner to open up or we're not creating that safe space. Mm -hmm. So they're comfortable to open up, right? And in this way, they just, it's easier to close up, especially if in your previous marriage or your previous relationship, you were punished for telling the truth or it would turn into the fight, right? It's like how often, like, and I think we all guilty of that when the fight starts, about something super silly, all of a sudden, like 30 minutes later, we're screaming and yelling bloody murder about something that has nothing to do with who's taking the garbage out, right? Mm-hmm. And we're already talking about the generations and, and money mismanagement and somebody looked at something, we- somebody weird, all kinds of nonsense comes out, but that was just a trigger. So what happens is like, and Eric actually taught me that analogy, Uh, And it was so visual and so helpful for me. Imagine like spouses are like two hands, right? You're one and Tom is another one or Eric and me, uh, one and the other hand. And when we have some misunderstanding, 
or we have uh, some miscommunication or uh, somebody offended somebody, even unintentionally, right? There is like a small layer of like a duct tape that goes around our hands. And because it's one, you can still break your hands. You can still kind of like move them around. But then somebody said something else or somebody, um, you know, offended you or somebody said something mean to you or somebody threatened your feelings or whatever it might happen. You know, another layer and another layer and another layer of duct tape goes around your hands and now you cannot break them. Now you cannot see clearly. Now you cannot get to the bottom of that problem. So that's why understanding this concept for me, we always, him and I, we always talk about this. Like, babe, this bothers me. Let's have a conversation right now. I know you guys have like a day of the week, right? When you guys do that. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not that patient. I, I cannot wait. I'm just like, I have to solve this right this second, right now. And so we, we kind of talk about it. And we're like, okay, I get your point. You get my point. And Sometimes there is a negotiation that happens in the process because you might want to defend your position, but you also need to listen and understand your spouse or your partner position. And that's what happens. So we communicate with respect. Mm -hmm. And once you make it a habit, you don't have to wait for the duct tape to build up and build up and build up. Because what happens is like, it's just like that um, uh, little snowball, you kick it from the top of the mountain, by the time it gets to the bottom, it's an avalanche. Right. That's what a lot of relationships do have. And that's why we see so many divorces, especially when kids get out of the house, they go to colleges, parents separate because they were trying to hold this craziness together for kids. Mm. But now they have nothing to talk about it. They grew apart so much. We either grow together as a couple or we grow apart. So the moment you start feeling that you're growing apart, try to do everything in your power to bring it back together. What are our common dreams? What are our hopes? What are what drives us? What what are passions that we have? What are habits that we want to create or whatever it might be? So constantly keep bringing you and your spouse on the same page so you can grow together. Mm -hmm. And that's why for me that was so helpful in my conversations with Eric, recognizing that if we do not talk about this, if we do not get to the bottom, if we do not clean the foundation for our empire to be built on, then we won't be able to build that empire because it's going to collapse like a courthouse. Oh, dude, the, the I, you're, we're talking about momentum, right? And I think that that's so damn powerful because if you're butting heads and you don't address it, that momentum is going to continue. And then yeah. to your point of it's a snowball effect that it just keeps going. And I've heard you talk, actually, I think it was more about business and I use the same philosophy, but the positive versus the negative momentum and mm -hmm. how, depending on, it can either be good or bad. Um, so talk to me about how you've actually used that, especially the positive momentum, because I think the 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 negative momentum you've just very eloquently laid out. Explain to me how we can actually use a positive momentum to create like either a great relationship or something in business, something successful in business. Once you recognize that, once you're aware that you are in a positive momentum, you just need to double down on that, right? And continue to build on and continue to build on. Uh, I'll give you, it's probably not gonna be quite the answer that you're looking for, but uh, inside of our business, we have uh, what we call 90 day game plan. And that basically means whatever your goal is, you're trying to put massive momentum, massive activity mm. into that short period of time right? Uh, if you're in a recruiting business, then you just basically, that's all you do. You're all in, you're making calls, you're making sales, you're making whatever it needs to be in your business, right? So you can build a customer base, so you can build a prospect uh, base, whatever it is, right? And it's going to be hard, but it's going to be for a season. It's not going to be forever. This is when you build that foundation that you can later grow, right? That's when uh, like burst of activity is something that is very similar to all the athletes, you know, like all the football players, right? They're not uh, working 24 seven every single day of the year, but they're working their butts off in preseason to get in shape for the season. They're working their butts off during the season and the postseason, they take a little break, they take a little time off so they can recover their bodies and start the season strong again. So. It might be more than 90 days for them, but 90 days is a pretty good concept. And what is interesting, um, 
when you make a decision, uh, the universe starts testing you. When you make a decision to change your life or to do something special or start that new project that you always dreamed of or start chasing your goals and dreams, the universe going to see if you're for real or if you're full of shit. And it's just going to say like, okay, let me throw a little wrinkle in here. Let me throw a little obstacle here. Let me do a little something. And if you back off, then you pretty much lose, right? But if you are strong and confident and determined to do something special, then you keep moving through all the different challenges. You keep moving through obstacles and um, you can eventually achieve those goals and dreams. But you have to withstand that wind, right? Mm. That is pushing your sail in the wrong direction because you think that you put the sail up. It's not just putting the sail up. It's about catching the wind because if wind blows into your face, it's hard to move forward. So you need to recognize when the wind is blowing and you need to recognize how to adjust your sail. So for me, it's it's recognizing that every time I start something different or I start a new project, that's going to be a test time and it's going to be scary and it's going to be frustrating and it's going to be, you know, challenging at times. But remember, uh, you mentioned something earlier talking about people that are not uh, achieving their dreams and not because of the self-esteem. I think it's not just self-esteem. Um, I saw one statistic a while back and it impacted me in such a powerful way. It says 98% of people die without fulfilling their dreams. Awesome. 98% of people. And you know the reason why? Because they're afraid to fail. So 98% of the population is afraid of failing not recognizing that the failure is part of the success. And I think it's one of the challenges that we see right now a lot on social media. People are like, oh, look at my you know, lifestyle. Look at me, glitz and glamour. Look at my Rolls Royce. Look at my private jet. Look at this, look at that. Not necessarily saying like, this is the struggle that I had to go through to get to that Rolls Royce. This, uh, these are the mistakes that I've made. This is how many times I've failed my face on the floor or on the concrete. This is how many times I had to scrape my shadow out of that road, you know, to get to that new height, to get to rebuild my belief, to rebuild my confidence and to build the life of my dreams. So we're not telling enough of these kind of stories. We're only kind of like, you know, waving that, you know, fuchsia flag like, hey, this is the celebration. But how we got there? all the struggle so at least we can understand that that's okay to fail you only fail when you quit when you stop trying that's the only way when you fail but if you keep moving forward one step at the time if you keep pushing forward one step at the time if you keep facing your fears one fear at the time you will get there you will absolutely get there just don't stop because most of the times your breakthrough is right around the corner your uh something the universe kind of pull back from pushing you in a, in a day in a in a second in a moment in a month but we do not feel that there is that breathing room there is that light at the end of the tunnel and i i remember there was one period of time when uh, i couldn't breathe because i couldn't bring my son uh to united states so i moved to states and uh, I separated with my husband at the time. And I was for three years, I was going back and forth every two weeks between the United States and Ukraine. And that was the time that I couldn't afford. Um, I mean, I was buying the cheapest airline ticket possible with so many connections that I don't even know how many. Uh, it, it was a long, long, long journey every two weeks. And every, you hate flying. You have a and fear I hate, of flying. And I have a fear of flying. So I had to suck it up. Like always. <laughs> but, you know, that was a tough time in my life because uh, it was not just because uh, it was hard on my body, right? Because it was 24-hour door-to-door journey. So I had to take three planes and then I had to drive myself for four hours. I would leave the car at the airport. Um, so that was not the hardest part. Um, not having the money to buy the tickets and trying to figure it out, it was not the hardest part either. The hardest part was me constantly missing one of my man. I was either missing my son or I was missing my husband. And recognizing that uh, at, at some point I couldn't breathe. But 
Eric kept reminding me, he's like, babe, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Just breathe. Just take one day at a time. We're going to find a solution. We're going we're gonna to make it happen. We're going to solve this problem. Because to me at that time, that was a problem that I absolutely must solve. There is no scenario when this problem is not solved, period. Because I cannot live without these two men. And I need to bring them together. So whatever heaven and earth I need to move to bring them together, I'm going to move. But it's tough in the process. It's even emotional for me to tell, tell this story right now. But it was so hard to live in that moment. But for everybody who's watching or if you're going through a tough time in your life, just know there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Just like we just finished winter and we're in the spring season, after every winter, spring is coming. Just like clock, every year. If you're questioning and wondering, spring is coming. It might be gloomy, it might be rainy, it might be snowing once in a while, but spring is coming. So whatever season in your life you're going through, just know it's not going to be forever. Mm -hmm. You're eventually going to go through it. So it's important for us to recognize that and toughen it up, you know, get a little patience. Uh, and recognize that we can find that final destination. We can get there as long as your reasons are strong enough. Oh, yeah, your why, 100%. Mm. And I didn't want to interrupt you, but dude, you know how powerful it was to watch you go, yeah, just had to suck it up, as always. Like, <laughs> that's the mentality that I'm trying to adopt, trying to help share, because it's not that you don't feel, right? It's right. not, I mean, you have the bit one of the biggest hearts I've ever seen like I've we've just obviously had a lot of private conversations and you have a massive heart so it doesn't mean that you don't feel it doesn't mean that you don't have these emotions it doesn't mean that you you are abnormal right in fact you're absolutely normal just like all the other women yep. and yet you can sit ha here and emotionally soothe and then say I gotta suck it up and this is the point like I never want to trigger people I'm never trying to dismiss people's experiences but anytime I think about why we women don't live the life we want, and it's because we get trapped, we get tripped up, and then how do we handle it? And I think staying on the floor is not the fucking answer. Getting back up is. Now, I say that with so much compassion and so much fucking love and heart to anyone that's listening. But at some point, I do just say to myself, Lisa, you just have to fucking suck it up. Yep. And then also... The things that you do behind the scenes, I've heard you really talk about this. So everything that we've spoken about is how do you show up? How do you mm -hmm. present yourself? How do you think? But I've heard you say the thing that really does separate, you You said in, in it was more about business, but I think of it as life, right? The leaders and the amateurs is what you do when you're by yourself. Yeah. Your habits. So talk to me about what habits you've adopted that have enabled you to go from insecure, really feeling badly about yourself, to a fucking battles. I'm determined to do something different. I'm determined to uh, show my kids what's possible. I'm determined to show my community of women what's possible. I'm determined to, you know, instill that passion into another woman or another man and the belief in themselves. I think that you ask like, why as women we we are not chasing our dreams because. The biggest, at least the answer that I found for myself is like, we don't, we don't believe that we are capable. We don't think we're worthy, right? So once we get to that higher level, we start sabotaging our own success. So for me, the different habits that I have uh, that help me is the most important part. I think that I'm inner driven person. Mm. And let me explain what that means. It's what do you do when nobody's watching, right? When I have... I have beautiful home, I have my gym in the house, and I have trainers coming every day at 9 a.m. And sometimes they travel, sometimes I travel, and they're not there. And I'm not always there in the gym. If they're not there, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm just like, eh, maybe I'm just going to take another nap and I'm sleep a little longer. But most of the times I was like, you know what, I know you're not feeling it, but it's good for you. Go get your ass in the gym, go jump on that bike, or go push some weights and go get it done. So I can, sometimes we often say, it's like, oh, we're so bad at selling. We're bad salespeople. I think if we ask right now, everybody in the audience, the hands would go up. It's like, I'm a bad salesperson. And I want to challenge that because we're so good. We can sell ourselves anything we want to sell. 
I can sell to myself that I need to lay in bed a little longer. I can sell to myself that I need to eat a little that extra fat steak because it's so juicy and it's so good. I can sell to myself everything I want to sell to myself, but I also need to recognize that, okay, there is another side of me salesperson who needs to push back because in every conversation, somebody's selling, somebody's buying. <laughs> Just like we're selling to our kids, eat your vegetables, do your homework. And they're selling back to us why they shouldn't, right? And why it's not important and why they didn't want to brush their teeth because that's fine, right? So somebody's constantly selling and somebody's buying. So that conversation inside of our heads, that sell, sales buyer, seller buyer conversation, it just whoever wins that day. One day, yay, Marina, powerful wins. And sometimes the lazy ass Marina wins. Mm. So there are different days. But I think that for me, what helps me tremendously, I'm, um, because I'm inner driven, because I have big goals, because I have big dreams, I push through the inconvenience. I push through me not feeling it, doing it. I push through the fear. I push through those things because that cherry at the end is more important mm -hmm. to me. That goal at the end is more important to me. You know, so that's what drives me. Most of the times when we are out of driven people, we need that stick. You know, we are driven either by carrot or by stick. You either need somebody to tell you, hey, you're going to get fired. If you don't show up at work, if you don't perform, you're going to get fired. Or it's like, hey, there is a promotion. There is a little extra money coming in on the table. Mm -hmm. So we are conditioned since we were little kids to be out of driven people. We conditioned to be told what to do. We conditioned since a young age, since kindergarten, do this, don't do that. Even we as parents, that's what we do. <gasps> don't touch this. Don't do this. Don't go there. Be careful. I, I'm guilty of that too. I do that to my kids as well. I'm trying to recognize that sometimes that's not healthy. I understand worrying about my kids and, you know, making sure they're safe is yes that's good and it's necessary but at the same time they need to learn on their own how many times as a kid you were told don't touch that candle you're going to burn your hand yeah and you still did touch it right did because it hurt, yeah it, did <laughs> it hurt yes it did hurt mm -hmm. but like you had to learn mm -hmm. it for yourself because here's the here's the truth i cannot teach you how not to make mistakes you, we all need to make our own mistakes. I can potentially, and as a parent, I, th I think our biggest responsibility is to allow our kids to do small mistakes so they can learn for themselves that hopefully will, pre will prevent them from making big mistakes. But they have to learn through experiences. You can read every book on success. You can go through every course or every seminar. It's not going to make you successful because you need to try through the, through the trial and error and success and mistakes and failures and victories. You have to be in the mix and try and see what works, what doesn't work in business, in relationship, in parenting, in health, in everything. It, trial and error, that's what works. So for me, I find things that work for me. I recognize that I do not want to be out of driven person. I do not want to be told what to do. I'm really bad at buying rules. If they're not my rules, sorry, that's not going to work. But uh, understanding that sooner we become inner driven, better it's going to be for our future because we're going to be able to push ourselves or sell ourselves the vision or the hope or the belief or the courage necessary to get to our final destination. Dude, I'm obsessed with this whole salesperson thing. It's so genius. And I'm always trying to think about how, how could I actually do that on a day to day? I think I would sit there and go, what do I actually sell myself on? Because to your point, I think you said it earlier, like we're not actually sometimes aware that we're necessarily doing it because we're almost like convincing ourselves why we're doing it. So what are we selling? Okay, I'm selling myself that I'm not good at this, that I should do this, that I shouldn't do that. I think it's so genius. And then go, well, what would the opposite salesman do? Like, how would I like re almost like reverse my pitch? Right. Because right? the salesman has a pitch. So the pitch is, you're going to feel so good if you just snooze that alarm. Think about how cozy this bed is, right? That's the salesperson yeah. trying to keep you in bed. And then yeah. the other, I, like, I would then counteract and go, okay, to, to get me out of bed, I'd be like, just think about those arms, Lisa, your muscly, defined arms, how sexy they're going to be. Right? And so yep. I, I'm, I'm like in real time, actually, I I'm in my own salesperson. <laughs> but it's so powerful. I love it. But I mean, to me, 
like I love awareness. Awareness is probably my most favorite mm. word recently because once you're aware of the situation, of the weakness, of the challenge, of the problem, that's when you can solve it because you cannot solve the problem you don't know you have it. So mm -hmm. for me, recognizing like, oh, these are my weaknesses. Oh, great. Thank you for pointing it out because now I can work and I can fix them. And oh, this is the problem. Well, thank you for letting me know because I did not know exist. Now I can go and solve that problem. So recognizing that having, first of all, awareness of who we are, what do we do, what's happening in our life, what's good, what's bad, what we can control, let go of what we can't control and and improve the things that we want to improve and hire help where we want we need help and we do not want to necessarily do those tasks. So for me, more I'm becoming aware of where I am and what's happening and how I can improve. It just helps me to grow faster. How though, as a control freak, do you let go of control? That's the toughest one. <laughs> I know. That's why I asked you, homie. <laughs> <laughs> that's the toughest one. And that's actually, I think, that's the reason why I'm afraid of flying. Not by any means that I'm pilot or I know how to fly the airplane. Oh, God, no. But I just, um, I don't know. I, I think it's that whatever crazy thought that I can probably do it better, you know? <laughs> Actually, take me through this because I, I'm <laughs> laughing, but there's real, there's real like trauma around yeah. flying. Like I, I, I don't want to dismiss that, and you know there is real fear. So how do you, and like actually take me through real time how you, whether it's flying or anything else, how do you work through that control element? Like what do you tell yourself to let go as you're like white knuckling it on the plane, right? Like. And again, just whether it's fear in general or specifically the plane, what is that sequence of events that happens in your brain that allows a control freak to let go of control? Huh. Well, that's that's interesting because um, it's not necessarily letting go of control. It's a little bit like surrendering, you know, because I recognize that pilots are trained specifically to do this job and they're way better than I am because I have no freaking clue how to fly an airplane. So they're going to do way better job than I ever could. Right. So that's the first thought. Like logistics, like Le actually just, just like, down yeah, to I'm, the I'm ground very logical. Yes. Yeah. So okay. I'm kind of like explaining to myself. Love I'm that. negotiating with myself. Okay. See, I'm, I'm selling to myself the story that they're better pilots. Right. Perfect. Okay. And that's what helps me through a lot of my fears is uh, to understand that the why the mission behind that, the vision behind it is much more important than my fear. So for me, flying would stand in my way to either see my kids mm. or to travel the world because mm. one of my definition of happiness is to see the beauty of this world with my own eyes and share it with people I do love and care about and doing it in style. So traveling and flying would get me to those places faster. But even more importantly, I... I want to contribute to as many women as I possibly can. I want to build that confidence. I want to build that belief in them. And oftentimes it takes me to be in their space. It takes me to be at the event, to be at that venue so I can present or I can talk or I can be in that mastermind and small group, whatever it is, right? So my mission is bigger than my fear. And I'm every time I'm thinking like, will I allow my fear to win because I'm a sucky loser? Loser, I do not want to lose even to myself. Mm. So I'll push myself because I will not allow that fear to control me. So <laughs> it's I, essentially a way of controlling it. Yeah. So it is actually a way of controlling it. So I'm not really letting go of the control. I am actually taking charge and I'm taking control, control, controlling the fear. That's amazing. But here's the funny thing. I think you're absolutely spot on. It's like, because when I asked the question, I actually meant it because I'm a bit of a control freak as well. And a lot of us, you know, joke about it. But as it, it can really become detrimental to, to our dreams. And that's why it was like, how do you process it? And even if it's, you just have to control the fear. And if that means you have to logistically, uh, logically walk your way through it mm -hmm. and come up with a conclusion that, yeah, yeah, you can't actually fly a plane better than a pilot. Right. Um, <clears throat> it allows you to then really take that step forward. Because again, that's just what I'm trying to think right. about. What holds us back from taking that freaking, you know, freaking step forward, leap forward. And it's the, the a big thing about fear. And I actually heard you say, which is so genius. It's like, it's not really like the fear of 
getting on stage, right? It's not necessarily getting on stage and being in front of the people. It's the unknown. Yes, the fear, the fear unknown is, in my opinion, is the biggest fear by far in the world because uh, right now the highest ranked fear is the fear of public speaking. 61% of the population is petrified of public speaking, me included. Uh, but I never saw anybody rank the fear of unknown. But to me, it's probably the highest fear out there because the uncertainty, the insecurity, the unknown is is the worst, right? What we what we've seen through all the challenging times through pandemic, we did not know what's going to happen tomorrow. We did not know what's going to happen with our health. We did not know what's going to happen with our jobs. We did not know what's going to happen with our securities. The, how are we going to pay our bills? How are we going to interact with people? How are we going to get together? None of those things. So a lot of those things were taken outside of our control. Mm. We were put into very unknown. Uh, insecure, uncomfortable situation. And we all had to cope with this. And that's why when, as soon as pandemic started, I started immediately recognizing that, you know, yes, there are gonna be a lot of lives lost because of the health challenges. And yes, there are gonna be a lot of financial distress. But more than anything, I'm really worried about the mental mm -hmm. uh, instability for a lot of people because you can only take so much stress as a human being, eventually you're gonna break. So that's why even seeing the news and them constantly telling how many people would die that particular day, even kind of like not even having on the volume, just having the TV screen behind me, kind of like pushing into my subconscious brain by noon, I would feel like a, such a big weight in my, like in my chest, and I was like, I can't breathe. And I felt all that negative information pushing me. So I recognize, first of all, I don't want to see it. Mm. I don't want to hear about it. I need to protect my mind from negative. I need to feed my mind with positive. I need to let go of things that I cannot control. I'm not a doctor. I'm sure all the smart doctors will figure it out. We have a lot of beautiful, amazing, talented people in this world. They'll come to me together. They will fix it. So letting go of control in a lot of ways is something that I had to learn and recognizing that Focus on what you can control and let go of the rest. Mm. This is probably the hardest thing for me to learn and to do to in, in my work, in my relationships, in everything, because I want to control everything. But then I recognize I'm just one woman. I cannot do everything, right? I need to trust my team that they're going to do a, a good job, right? That's what they hired to do. That's where they bring those professional skill sets that I may not necessarily possess. So shame on me being so stupid and ego driven thinking that I can do better than them. So, okay, let them do their job. And at the same time, also recognizing I need to spend my time what I can do best instead of just trying to do, you know, folding the laundry and, you know, running and filling the gas in my cars and doing all kinds of stuff that it's necessary, but somebody else can help me do that while I can do only things that I can't do. The talents and skills that I possess that somebody else doesn't. So I can be more productive with my time. So I can be more uh, fulfilled. So I can actually move in direction of my passion and my mission instead of being lost and by trying to freak out about everything that is mm -hmm. happening in the world that I absolutely have zero control over. God, do you think that that came mm -hmm. from your childhood growing mm -hmm. up in a communist country? The, the controlness? Yeah. Possible. It, it can be because we were like so controlled, it's just fascinating. Yeah. But I do believe a lot of things come because uh, the things that the skill sets that I have and some of my strengths that I have be as a thanks to the circumstances that I was raised in. Like for example, problem solving. I think it's probably one of my highest skill set is to solve problems, right? And finding the solutions and being resourceful because the way I was brought up and raised, I did not have a lot of resources. Uh, we would have, uh, and that takes me way back in my uh, childhood, it was like we would have uh, huge empty shelves in, in the mall and there would be one doll for all the girls with a couple different colors dresses and there would be one truck for the boys, same truck. So at the birthday party, you would get three, five dolls, however many kids you invited, and the same doll or five trucks or whatever, 
exactly the same toy, but I would draw my own little games, you know, like take a coin and write around the coin and with a, like a little cube, create my own little board game, right? Or I would cut out the doll out of them out of the cardboard and I would just make a little draw little dresses and put some dresses on her. So I had to do something different, right? I had to be creative. I had to be resourceful, even though I'm horrible at drawing, even though I'm horrible at those things, I did not use it as an excuse. I was like, oh, look at this. Nobody has this beautiful doll, <laughs> just me, right? So finding ways to solve different circumstances, solve different problems, like our good friend Marie Forleo says, everything is figure outable, mm -hmm. right? Everything is figure outable if you put your mind to it. So I'm absolutely grateful to all my life experiences because they made me who I am today. I would not change absolutely anything. Even my relationship, my abusive relationship, I would not change a single bit because now I know what relationship should not look like. And because of that, I was able to find a man of my life, my, my life and love of my life, right? So all those experiences, regardless of how hard they might be, and especially if you in the moment, you think like, why this is happening to me? Why me, God, why, why me? And in most cases, when you look back in time, five years later, 10 years later, that was the best thing that happened to you. That divorce, the best thing that happened to you. You lost that job, the best thing that happened to you. Because later you said, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm worthy. I'm capable. I can achieve way more than I was giving myself credit for. Let's go chase that dream. Let's go chase that relationship. Let's go chase that opportunity. But at some point, you need to get into the circumstance where your way is only forward and your back is against the wall. And sometimes somebody or something has to put us with our back towards the wall so we can only move forward. And we don't like it because nobody wants to be put with the back in the wall. But sometimes it's necessary. And but time, in most cases, is the best thing that happened to us. Oh, Mike drop, girl. That was so damn fire. Honestly, couldn't put it by myself. Thank you so much for being so open, so vulnerable. Where can people find you? Where can people find all the amazing things, the support that you're really giving to women and the events that you're doing? Instagram is probably the best place to find me. It's just my name and last name, Marina Worry. Uh, I would love to. Amazing. See guys, you guys, there. go check her out. When I talk about how on earth we get up as women, it doesn't define you that you fall. It doesn't define you when you fall on your knees. So use the tools that she just laid out and go be the hero of your own life. Guys, peace. Click here to learn how to respond when someone disrespects you. Getting a little bit irritated because it was just male egos going back and forth about who had more money and, and who knew more about Malibu real estate and what the values were, but not actually talking about the portfolio in and of itself. And so I...